Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming tonight to the first of the candidate forums for um, those people running for the City Council of Rancho Palos Verdes. My name is Nancy Marr, and I'm with the League of Women Voters. But this evening is really presented to you tonight with a combination of uh, organizations helping the PVP Chamber of Commerce and the AUW of PVP, along with the League. So we're collaborating tonight. And we're doing this in the interest of voter education, voter service, and voter outreach. I'd like to introduce our moderator for tonight, Linda Herman. Linda is a member of the League of Women Voters of Palos Verdes. She has been on the board of the County League of Women, Vo <coughs> League of Women Voters, and she has been, um, is a past president of the State League of Women Voters. She's moderated many forums, and I'm very pleased that she is able to be with you, and she will give you a lot more information. Uh, good evening. I'm pleased to welcome you, as, as Nancy did, to the Palos Verdes City Council Candidates Forums. Uh, candidate meetings uh, such as this have been around m almost as long as the League of Women Voters. In 1924, a booklet, booklet published by the League of Women Voters suggested that we conduct candidate meetings as a service to voters because it gives them a means of formatting or forming a first-hand judgment of the candidates and as a service because it gives them an opportunity to present their views to audiences of varied political affiliations. The directive and the reasoning have not changed. I can hear you. Sorry. The directive and the reasoning have not changed through the years. Hundreds of league candidates nights are held each year. They are considered special events in the election calendar and for very good reasons. They are unbiased. They are conducted for in informational purposes without a hidden agenda and are controlled by principles of nonpartisanship. Voting is an essential step in the process of democracy. In exercising our choice for elective office, we affirm our faith in the democratic process. We are therefore pleased to present the following candidates seeking a position on the Rancho Palos Verdes City Council. We have five candidates for the three positions available. David Bradley, Ken Dida, not in order here, but Ken Dida. <laughs> David, this is in alphabetical order. <laughs> Dave Emenheiser, Barbara Ferraro, and Stephen Peristam. Each candidate will have a two minute opening statement and then one and a half minutes to respond to questions from the audience. The question and answer period will be followed by a two minute closing statement. Our timers will hold up a card indicating when their time is up, and they are sitting right here in these first two seats. As we, as we will try not to stop you in mid-sentence, we ask that you be responsive to the time limitations. I would ask the audience that you remain as quiet as possible while the candidates are speaking so that everyone may hear, and please hold your applause until the forum has ended so that candidates will have all the time possible for getting their points across. And as usual, and as usual, we ask that you turn off your cell phones. We will then open the forum uh, to questions from the audience, and we'll conclude our question and answer period about 8.45 to allow time for each candidate to present a two-minute closing statement. The complete forum will be videotaped for showing on the RPV cable channels, and the air dates, if you are interested, on, will be on Wednesday, October 16th through Saturday, October 19th at 6 p.m. on channel 35 and Fios 39. And I can repeat that at the end of, this, at the, end of the forum. Um, you may direct your questions to one or more candidates, and others who wish to respond may do so as well. Ushers are at the ready around the room and have already been collecting questions, but they have cards and pencils for you to write out your questions if you have not already done so. Sorting of questions may occur, but mainly to eliminate duplication. Our goal is to cover the broadest possible range of subject matter to make sure that questions can be answered by all candidates and to ensure that they are in the form of questions, not statements. <laughs> Questions that are unclear, hostile, or of a, a personal nature will not be used. Those that fall in the same general area may be consolidated to allow us to cover as many topics as possible in the time allotted. All questions become the property of the League of Women Voters of Palos Verdes, Peninsula, and San Pedro. Sorry. <laughs> 
The order of opening statements was determined by lot before we began. Before we began. Oops. So we will begin. Our first speaker is um, Dave Emenheiser. Dave? Great. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. My name is Dave Emenheiser. Thank you all for coming tonight. So good to see so many of my neighbors and, and uh, friends in the audience. My thanks to the League of Women Voters, the Chamber of Commerce, uh, Eileen, uh, Linda, and Nancy for putting on this great forum. You know, I moved to California because I fell in love with a woman from Los Angeles, and uh, uh, Mickey can't be here tonight because she's at a, she's at a church meeting, but uh, the first time we saw Rancho Palos Verdes, we, we fell in love with this great city, and so we moved here 19 years ago. We are drawn to its natural beauty, uh, its great schools, its sense of community. Mickey and I raised two boys. One's a graduate of Penn High, uh, Penn Peninsula High School, and the other one uh, went to PB High. As for my experience in civic, uh, civic uh, city government, I'm a member and former uh, commissioner with the RPV Planning Commission. I served on the commission for eight years, uh, and then I was also chairman and a member of the Finance Advisory Committee. During that 10-year period, I've also served as president and a member of my HOA, and I currently serve as our rep to the Council of Homeowners Associations. I think of myself as an experienced outsider uh, running an issues-based campaign, and I hope we receive lots of questions tonight on crime, city budget, infrastructure, city hall, Portuguese Bend landslide, and I look forward to your questions. You know, I love the quality of life uh, that we have here in Rancho Palos Verdes, and I'll work and I'll fight to preserve it. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming out tonight. Our next speaker, Barbara Ferraro. Good evening. I'm Barbara Ferraro, and I'm running for RPV City Council because I want to preserve our beautiful way of life here. Our founding fathers fought for low density, low taxes, and local control. I have served in the past as planning commissioner, councilwoman, mayor pro tem, and mayor. And I am offering my experience and my leadership again to the city that I love. When I was a kid, my daddy was a preacher. And we moved a lot, every two to four years. And so I never really felt, felt like I had a home. And my husband and, I, and Charlie and I first moved to RPV 43 years ago. And we've been in our present home for 32 years. This is home, our home. We have been active participants in the community for many years. I care about this community and I am willing to serve again. I'm an educator at Palos Verdes High School, a mother of three children, but sometimes I count more because of exchange students that lived with us. And now I'm a grandmother of two or three or five, depending on how you count, and I want the best for them. I will fight to keep our city the jewel that it is. I will listen to the residents and try my best to do what is right for this city. Just because we have reserves doesn't mean we have to spend all our money. I am conservative. I would be honored if you would choose me as one of your three votes on November 5th. Just check Barbara Ferraro for Rancho Palos Verdes City Council. Thank and you, thank you all for coming out tonight. Thank you, Barbara. Um, our next speaker, Ken Dida. Thank you very much. Uh, I go back to the very beginning in terms of having lived here since 61, and <laughs> in 1970, I was fortunate to be one of the five members of St. Um, sorry, did, did you hear me in the back? I'm sorry, I had my mic off. Anyway, uh, I was fortunate enough to be one of the five members of the board on Save Our Coastline, which actually orchestrated the incorporation of Rancho Palos Verdes. Uh, I've served five terms uh, on the city council. Uh, three of those were as mayor. And as a result, 
I've also worked in the interim times when I wasn't on the council on just about every committee. I was the chairman of the First View Restoration Committee. I was on our first planning commission. I was chairman of the first Finance Advisory Commission, and I can go on to all those services that I put forward during that time. Realistically speaking, I'm the only candidate with the institutional memory of what the founding principles of our city were. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Peristam. Thank you. Thank you, Lee, women voters of the Palos Verdes Peninsula, the Palos Verdes Peninsula Chamber of Commerce, and the Palos Verdes branch of the American Association of University Women. I thank you all for giving me the opportunity to speak with you this evening. I've been a resident of our beautiful city for 35 years. Along with my wife, Carol, we have raised our three children here. It has always been of greatest importance to me to preserve and protect the wonderful quality of life that our city offers. So for the last 30 years, I've tried to do a small part towards that goal. In 1989, I was one of the co-authors of the city's Proposition M, the View Protection Ordinance that has become a foundation for protecting our residents and neighborhoods from overbuilding and view blockage. For eight of the last 13 years, I've served and I'm currently serving on the city's planning commission. I've always felt not only a desire, but a duty to do so, what I can for the city because my education and background as a land use planner directly ties to our city's founding and remains a central focus of the many of the key challenges facing the city now and in the future. I have a master's degree in regional planning from Penn State, and I began my professional career employed as a county land use planner back in Pennsylvania, where I'm originally from. During the next two hours, I will go into more detail about my views on repairing and strengthening our infrastructure, on enhancing fire protection, on preserving our open space, on retaining local control, on fiscal responsibility, on helping our business community, and other matters of importance to the city. I'm endorsed by current council members Susan Brooks and Eric Alegria, as well as by Mayor Pro Tem John Cruikshank. They support me because, after discussions with each of them, we have a mutual respect for city governance, fiscal responsibility, and an analytical approach to decision making. I th thank them for their leadership and their endorsements. If elected, I will keep RPV strong. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Bradley. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, the other candidates that are up here tonight. I think uh, the city of RPV is in a wonderful position. I think there's five, five, can five fine candidates for everybody to choose from. So I want to applaud my fellow candidates for getting up and putting their name into the hat because I think it's a great um, slate of candidates for you all. I'd like to thank the uh, League of... Uh, Women Voters, the PV Chambers of Commerce, the American Association of University Women for putting on this forum this evening and allowing us to uh, share our views with you uh, within the community. Um, I want to look forward to the future. Um, I am a engineer by trade. I've served on various commissions within the city. I've been a little league coach. I've been an AYSO coach. Um, I'm a local boy. I mean, I grew up in Palos Verdes. I went to PV Unified. I graduated from Rolling Hills High School. I'm now sending two sons to Rolling Hills, actually, sorry, Peninsula High School. It's hard for me to get that out of them. Um, but I have a long history within the community. I want to continue to try to preserve our rural oasis. I want to look to the future. I want to bring back civility to City Hall. I want to continue to work towards having open transparency in all decisions. There are some things that have to be done uh, in closed session, but those are the very small amount of business. I want open transparency. Not everybody will be happy with every decision, but at least the decision process will be out there in the open. Um, and I also want to respect everybody's opinion and try to craft the best uh, position as we move forward into the future. Um, and with that, thank you very much, and I hope to get to your vote. Thank you so much. Okay, we're on to our first question, and not necessarily wanting to go always in the same order, but somewhat in the same order. Perhaps we can begin with Mrs. Ferraro. The question asks, what qualities and experience would you look for in a new city manager? That's a really good question. I happened to be the mayor when Les Evans was hired and when we interviewed him. And it's okay to make a list of qualifications and say they've got to have this much experience and they've got to have this degree. But I think the most important thing is that they really understand our community, that they know what we're all about. 
for the most part, we're not flashing cash, Beverly Hills. We're conservative. We're concerned about our kids' education. Um, we can spend money if we think it's uh, of value to us or our children or our city. But we don't go out and be frivolous. And I want someone who can grasp the nature of our community. And I think that's the most important uh, quality that a, a new manager should have. Okay, thank you. Uh, before we go on to Mr. Dida, I just wanted to mention if you have a question and if you'll just raise your hand, somebody is standing around to collect your additional questions, okay? Okay, um, Mr. Dida, city manager. <laughs> yes, I think it's the city manager has to be an, an executive officer for the city. He has a large responsibility. And the most important one is basically to understand and try to do exactly what the city council wants done as it operates within the bounds of its meetings. Uh, it can't, he can't respond to any one member of council. It's got to be the entire council. He's got to be sensitive to that. Secondly, I think Barbara said it correctly, he's got to understand the city. And the best way they can do that and I, would be to re, read our general plan, read our goals report, and with those two things, you'll get the understanding of what our citizens really want and you can function properly. Thank you. Okay, next, Mr. Peristan. Okay, thank you. Under our form of government with a uh, weak, it's called a weak council, strong city manager form of government, the city manager has an enormous responsibility. And so that, that means we're looking for somebody that really is a superman. I said this before, I wouldn't want the job. It's really tough on them. They have bosses, they have bosses being the community, they have bosses being the, the council members. So what we're looking for, we start with a very high level of who we are looking for. I don't have any barriers to that search whether it's uh, our zip code or it's across, this, across the country. We need to think of the right person. And that is a combination of somebody that understands our city or can quickly grasp understanding our city and a skilled, successful uh, city manager with, with has a proven track record. So I probably just up the bar a little bit higher for the poor people that are gonna have to come in and, and uh, follow in this footsteps. But uh, that's, that's the playing field they're on and uh, we're gonna keep that expectation high, thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Bradley. Thank you. So in our new city manager, I think we have to look for somebody that has a strong leadership potential or has demonstrated strong leadership. Uh, somebody that is able to work in a collaborative environment with both the city as well as the community. Uh, somebody is willing to work in an open and transparent way. We need to have open transparency within all the dealings of the city. And then somebody that also understands that they do work for city council. In our form of government, where we have a non-professional city council, uh, we do rely heavily on our, our uh, city manager as a chief executive. But that chief executive needs to understand that they work for the city council and are doing the bidding of the city and not doing the bidding of staff. But so is somebody that needs, that we are going to look to, is somebody that can work with all of those constituents constituencies and craft the best all-around solution to some of the problems that we'll be facing. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Emenheiser? Thank you. Thank you, Linda. You know, this will be one of the more momentous uh, decisions of the new council. We'll be uh, selecting the city manager. And I think uh, we need to search for the man or woman that has uh, great managerial ability and is open and transparent in their dealings with the public. Uh, someone who implements policy instead of trying to, uh, to make policy. Uh, you know, I thought our, our current now former city manager did a great job of keeping the roads paved and the, and the parks in shape, but I also thought that he thought of himself as, as the mayor instead of the city manager. And, uh, and so we need somebody that I think is open to public input and open to the public's opinion instead of trying to foist their opinion on the public. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. I think we'll begin with Mr. Dider right now. And the next question is the following. Um, what are your views on how to address the landslide? 
<laughs> we should start with you had to start with him on that one, didn't you? And we should start with Kim. It's, what, it's what came up. I didn't do it. You can't blame me. All right. He, he may need I, a minute or two to try to craft a response to this one. No. Okay. Basically, we have two examples when I wrote the legislation for the Geological Hazard Abatement District. The process works. The landslides there were moving eight feet a year. They're now moving less than one inch. We're not gonna stop it, we're gonna control it. The second thing is we have determined through all sorts of research over 40 years of it, trying all sorts of things about wave action, and it really is water. The amount of water that's pushing the, the land and making it float uh, basically above uh, the slip plane. Those are the issues. We have spent $45 million in the past few years, in the past 30 years, basically uh, putting Band-Aids on it. We haven't really addressed the problem. It's time we stop the hemorrhaging of our tax dollars on solutions that don't work and merely exacerbate the problem in terms of sinking Portuguese uh, PV Drive South over 250 feet approaching sea level. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Peristam. Thank you. Uh, I was here Monday where there was a presentation by the geologist that updated the community on the situation with the landslide. It was very interesting. It was, it was well done. It was uh, in, informative, and it gave us a sense of what we can do. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave part of that aside in saying that these were the engineers that have been studying this for a number of years. So what they presented us was, was, was factual to the, under, to the degree that they understood the problem and defined the problem. What I see as the next step in this process is to provide alternatives for how we want to go forward. And that means that we have to make the decision what, what's, what are we going to include in each of these alternatives? Do we take that little bite and address part of the slide? Do we take that big bite and we, and we, and we cost at greater cost? We take a bigger bite of that slide and then we need to assess what the results are from the, that uh, first step. So phasing is going to be the big challenge, I believe, of the next council with how we actually go forward on this and implement an implementation strategy. And that was not addressed yet. That's the next step coming forward, and that's going to be the challenge of the new council, and that has a tremendous impact on the scope of each of those steps with the associated costs with each of those steps. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, Mr. Bradley. Thank you. I, too, uh, was, uh, I was not at the uh, hydrology meeting on Monday, but I did read some of the documentation that was presented. And I think that we need to focus on the fundamentals of getting the water out of the area, preventing the water from, being, from intruding, um, which is a multi-city issue. I think some of the things that were on the table are very large, and I'm not projects from a cost uh, perspective, and I'm not sure that they're going to work. I think we need to be able to ensure ourselves if we're going to spend somewhere between 45 and 55 million dollars to try to stabilize that area, that whatever we do is going to work. But I think before we do and try to remediate it, we need to work on removing the water intrusion into the area and getting into the slip plane and causing additional uh, movement within the land there. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Emmenheiser. Thank you, Linda. You know, anyone who drives uh, a car on PV Drive South knows that the land is moving. Supposedly, it's the most active landslide in the United States, and everybody wants to find a way to, to stop it. City officials just funded another half a million dollar uh, survey study to find the cause and seek solutions. And, they and I was at the meeting where they presented them uh, on Monday. The causes are pretty clear. They're water, rainfall, uh, underground water, water from septic systems and lawn ir irrigation up in rolling hills. The solution, uh, that's the hard part. Uh, as presented on page uh, 77 of, the re of their report, $53 million over 30 years to pave the bottoms of the canyons, to run pipes and, and pumps to drain the water, to build a modern sewer system for the residents of Rolling Hills. My question is, will this work or will this new construction project just end up like the earlier projects uh, with pipes down on the beach and dewatering wells that have been sheared off? Uh, 
And where do we go to get our refund for this $53 million? Where's our guarantee? <laughs> especially if it doesn't work. This is a complex issue with an expensive potential solution. I think we need to hold the vote of the citizens. If we're going to embark on something as expensive as what has been proposed, I think the citizens need to weigh in on it. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Ms. Ferrara. Mrs. Ferrara. <laughs> thank you. We've been working on this problem for a long, long time. I've been off the council for 15 years, I was working with the city as planning commissioner and council member for 10 years, and we worked on this then. The problem, obviously, is the water, and a lot of it is what comes down from Rolling Hills. And as one person said one time, they have better lawyers than we have. It is going to take cooperation, and we've tried dewatering wells, and they've sheared off. You know, there's a plain of bentonite, and when it gets wet, it's like soap, and the, the ground above it slides. I don't know that we should be putting 40 to $50 million into a, quote, solution without really understanding whether or not that's going to work. I've even been in Washington and talked to the Army Corps of Engineers, and they had planned on putting a berm at the toe, and then they finally figured out that the land was gonna keep moving and was going to, to move the, to the berm of uh, the toe at the end of the landslide right on out to sea. So I don't know that anyone has yet come up with a permanent solution. And she says I should stop. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, uh, we begin now with Mr. Peristam. The next question, I, these are, we're beginning with the hard ones is all I can tell you. What are your views on a new city hall? <laughs> wow. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> new city hall. Well, there's going to be a presentation next Tuesday to the city council on recommendations on uh, the initial, the initial uh, 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 layout and, and recommendation and then the request to whether to go forward or not. So I want to point out that we really are not at the point where we're evaluating the cost of this or evaluating it exactly is going to be a, all the component parts of this city complex. So before we go and jump to what the cost may be, we need to define what's going to be there. And this is a place where we really need to separate our needs from our wants. We need something done at City Hall. We keep on fixing the roof. This is a, the, my home analogy. You, know, you can fix the roof so many times, and then sooner or later you're gonna get a new roof. It just makes sense. And that's the thing we have here with City Hall. We need something done. It may be significant. It may be a, a remodel, a, a major remodel, or it may be a new structure. But we need to determine what that is, and we need to eventually cost that. There's other parts of the project that are uh, uh, public safety related to uh, police and fire services there, and that's something that's going to be complicated for for a while because there needs to be uh, th those two agencies have to catch up and what they want to do uh, with their locating at the facility. The other part of that is the is the wants, and that's all the other things that may be out there that we may want in the future at this site. Right now, over the years, the surveys have taken place, and there's really nothing that ever gets out of double digits except a dog park, and now we have a dog park. So we're going to have to determine and not have all the answers until we address our needs, and then we'll address our wants. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, Mr. Bradley. Thank you. Well, I can remember when City Hall was a Nike missile base when I uh, was growing up here. Um, when we founded the city, I think we were trying to do it as efficiently as possible and we were reusing uh, existing infrastructure. I think that infrastructure has uh, deteriorated over the years and anybody that's been into the city staff areas uh, will see that it's a warrant of offices and cables and window air conditioning. Um, not really conducive to a efficient run city government. I think we need to take a look at how to craft city government for RPV to run efficiently. Then we need to plan a facility around that. I don't think we need to do a facility that is a grand monument, but I think we need to do something that is supportive of efficient city government, a remodel of the current infrastructure with an expansion, a modest expansion to be able to facilitate the efficient use and the, uh, the 
the efficient uh, execution of city government. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Emenheiser. Thank you. Well, I think it's well known, and I'm a skeptic of uh, the new city hall, the new civic center, uh, especially about the issue of cost. I've heard city officials put the price tag at $30 million to $100 million. The current plan is to double the size of City Hall, build 150-seat uh, city council chambers, so think of this room doubled, uh, to even have a 5,000-square-foot uh, restaurant for the city employees. Talk about wants and needs. Uh, this has been a, an initiative that's largely been out of the sight of the public, but the lobbyists have been paid, the environmental consultants have been paid, the staff and the advisory committee has been, uh, have been meeting, and sometime in the next three years, a uh, proposal will come to council. Let me be clear, if the county, if the state, if the federal government wants to pay for it, wonderful. Uh, but if the taxpayers of RPV have to pick up the tab, I think we have to put it on the ballot and include the price tag. One quick story, on your way out, you can pick up uh, what uh, uh, a uh, OC register article on what happened when Newport Beach started building a $40 million civic center and they ended up with a $140 million civic center and a $127 million bond that they're still paying on. Thank you. Okay, uh, Ms. Ferraro. Thank you. There are definitely some things that need to be done at City Hall, but whether or not we need a new one, I think really should be up to the voters. It is a, it is a balance between wants and needs, and they definitely need an air conditioning system that works that is not a hose that goes out to the window. Um, I worked for years just to get an elevator in there, and um, things move slowly. But I think that there are improvements that can be made, whether or not we should move, say, the Lomita Sheriff's in there, or even the fire department. I don't know that that's a good plan. We'd have to consider traffic. So I think it's a far, a far piece, as they would say where my mama came from, from being any kind of definite plan and if it gets to be some kind of Taj Mahal, then I think it has to go to the voters. Because if, if the citizens really want something magnificent on that hill, I would support them. But I want to know that it's the citizens that want it and that we make sure that what we need is encompassed in that new facility. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Dida. Everybody's saying we have to look at needs versus wants, and I would certainly support that, and I always have. Uh, when we talk about uh, moving the facility from here to there, there are certain advantages that would actually play into that. As we can see in the kind of setup we have here constantly being changed, so something permanent that uh, would work a lot better is something we need to look at. It does not need to be, as Barbara said, a Taj Mahal. It needs to be functional, but we need to identify what functions we want it to serve. And as far as getting a vote on it, if that facility gets to be built, there will be a bond issue, in, in my opinion, and as a result, the citizens will have a vote as they should. <coughs> so the funding will be determined by the citizens as well as what the complex should look like. Uh, we don't need a lot of the uh, special functions like restaurants and stuff. That's not what a city hall is supposed to be and that's not what a civic center is. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. We'll now begin with Mr. Bradley. Uh, the, this is a new question. Uh, what is your plan for the homeless people living in Rancho Palos Verdes? The homeless people that are living in Rancho Palos That's Verdes? That's the question. Well, I think that there 
I'm going to morph that question a little bit because as of right now, I don't know that we have any homeless people living in Rancho Palos Verdes, but I do know that the uh, RENA numbers are going to be uh, paramount in the future, and that's the uh, uh, regional housing numbers that we're going to have to do for affordable and low-income housing that uh, is going through the State House right now, and some of those things are taking away local control. Um, I'm very passionate about this, that we need to come up with a plan where we can support affordable housing, but at a reasonable way within the city. Uh, we need to be able to work with Sacramento and get exemptions to some of the more onerous um, um, portions of current legislation because it just doesn't fit into our city. Um, we don't have the infrastructures to support high density housing, which if things go really badly, could be forced upon us. Um, we need to uh, be very proactive, lean forward, work with um, our representatives in uh, Sacramento to make sure that uh, affordable housing is uh, implemented in a way that's sustainable for the city. Okay, thank you. Mr. Emenheiser. Thank you. I'm a little bit like Dave. I, I don't... I want to challenge the premise. Uh, I don't think we have a homeless problem in RPV compared to other cities in Los Angeles County. Uh, maybe, maybe we have an occasional homeless person. I've had uh, homeless people sleeping in their car out front of my house and resisted the urge to call the sheriff, uh, hopefully like other people would. But I, I do think that um, uh, you know, we may we may occasionally uh, or sometime in the future we may have a homeless uh, a problem, and I would morph back into the housing issue a little bit, like Dave alluded to the state of California's solution to uh, the housing problem is for each city to take its share, and RPV's share is 311 units. Now, think in your mind where we would put 311 units in RPV, and I think you you notice uh, the kind of problem we have. But, uh, you know, our city was founded on land use control, and we need to defend that. When it comes to the homeless, uh, I think uh, uh, charity and, and, and a Christian heart is, is, is the best solution for right now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Ms. Farrar? Thank you. Well, I think one of the problems, both with the question and... Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad that wasn't my phone. <laughs> That's why I left mine in the Sorry, car. Sorry, <laughs> my apologies. May I start over? Yeah. <laughs> Please. Okay. Um, I think one of, the, one of the biggest problems with homelessness is that no one is really trying to address the real problem, which is basically either addiction or mental health. It's not really even a housing problem. It is a, a health problem. It's addiction, mental health. And maybe you wonder how I know this. I had an older daughter who passed away last year and she was homeless, and she was an alcoholic and probably a drug addict. She died in Oregon. And we went up there this summer to talk to some of the people that knew her. We talked to the police and the firemen that, he, that had come to help her when, they, when she was found on a doorstep. And I know from talking to people that worked with, and there's still a big homeless population there, and um, that this is what they see all the time. It is a health problem. And plus, our state has changed laws so that you can't even get them help anymore. It's, um, it's very, very difficult to have someone put away without their permission, and they're not in a mental state to give their permission. And I have to stop. Thank you very much. Mr. Dida. There is a difference between homeless and a low income. 
for affordable housing. Our city has had for a long time, uh, right from its outset, because I was the city's representative to Southern California Association governments, which puts all those numbers together. And we do provide affordable housing. We've, we've met our goals. We're uh, six, you've got a, I, f I forget how many years to go yet to get another 67 affordable units. In this. And we do that in every development that we permit. They have to provide a certain number of affordable uh, uh, shelter for them. Even though it's in the same building, they change the size, the scope, but you can't tell the difference. Mirandella on the corner of Crestridge and Crenshaw is an example of that. So uh, dealing with the, the low income issue is really the, the problem that we need to address. I'm concerned that we're losing local control because the state assembly uh, is constantly looking at ways to solve a problem that they've created, in my opinion. And uh, that's not going to go anywhere. They are considering, there are some people now considering of putting quotas on what you have to do for homeless. Uh, we fought for local control. It's being eroded constantly. And the paradise you live in now is, in my view, potentially in jeopardy. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Peristam. Thank you. Uh, Rancho Palos Verdes is generally not geographically a desirable location for homeless people, and we're fortunate for that. That's really nothing that we've done or haven't done. That's just, just, just our geography. The, state, the city follows the state laws for enforcement, and it's provided by the, the county sheriff when there is an incident. That's just what we do because we don't have a significant problem. We may have occasional, the occasional problem. And this is an example of something, that, a problem that local control is not going to solve. This is a, a societal problem. It's a California problem. And the idea that we're going to take it on as a local city, as an individual city, and solve this problem, it's really not just realistic. It's just the, the fact that we don't have a, a lot of uh, highly developed commercial areas, so it's not desirable because there's isolation. And so that means we're fortunate. We have some on Western Avenue, and that's why we, because it's more desirable location. So we need to urge our state leaders to address this problem differently, and then we'll all benefit, not just the city of Rancho Palos Verdes, who is pretty fortunate in this situation, but we need a broader, a broader solution from the state. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we're, we've run through, everybody's had their first opportunity, so we're gonna start again with Mr. Emenheiser, and the question is, do you support or oppose Measure B? What are the reasons for your position? Thank you. You know, I'm opposed to, to Measure B like the entire entire city council and like all the candidates. I think uh, Taryn A has been a good neighbor to RPV. It's now funding 25% of our budget an annually. Uh, I'm, I'm very concerned that uh, the union is attempting an overreach, and my preference would be that they try to win a vote among the employees at Terranea as opposed to trying to win a vote among the citizens of Rancho Palos Verdes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Ms. Ferraro? Ferraro? <laughs> thank you. I'm definitely opposed to Measure B. So just, well, not just because I say so, but the whole council and every candidate is asking you to vote no. They, it is an attempt by an outside um, union to come in and impose on the employees because this union was offered the opportunity to have an election among the employees and Terranea said they would abide by whatever the result of the election was. And the union refused and went the proposition route to try and end run because the, basically they knew the employees weren't going to vote for it. As you have, if you've noticed any of the mailers that have come, they're full of, of statements and pictures of employees that are very happy working there. So it's not something for the employees at all. In fact, it will cost them a lot of money because then they'll have union dues that they don't have now. And as far as panic buttons go, They've had them for three years. And don't let them tell you that it's just a noisemaker. I heard one of their representatives that was going around walking was telling people that. They have state-of-the-art GPS location notification 
um, buttons. So please vote no. Thank you, and Mr. I'm Dyer. sure the rest of them will tell you the same Mr. thing. Dyer. Measure B will end up putting the city as the HR department for Taranea. That's not a city government function. It's not any government's function, as a matter of fact. The cost of the city, I mean, our, my colleagues here on a day has talked about all the other issues that I totally agree with. Uh, it's based on a lot of lies. They say it's not gonna cost the city anything. If you're the HR department and you have to enforce an ordinance, Taranea doesn't enforce the ordinance. You as taxpayers through your city will have to enforce that ordinance. Grievances, lawsuits, you got a whole new HR department. That's a waste of your tax dollars. So you need to vote no just to save that if nothing else. And the rest of what they're talking about are all lies. Can you imagine saying that thou, the employer has to provide you with uh, transportation. transportation to and from your home? How many of you get that from your employer? Raise your hand, I don't see any. <laughs> These are the kinds of things they're looking to impose uh, and they're also willing to negotiate them away. So what, what are they trying to do? It's all about dues money to the union, period. Thank you, Mr. Peristam. Thank you. I'm also opposed to Prop or Measure B, and I ask people to read it. Simply read it, and you'll decide for yourself how bad piece of legislation this really is. I believe the ballot qualification was required for signatures was accomplished by misleading people. And I've spoken to a number of people since they signed it and they were really appalled and, and annoyed the fact that they signed it and they didn't take the time to really understand what was presented to them. It was presented to them as a personal safety issue and not the rest of this, what everybody's expressed, different parts of the baggage that goes along with it, but it's really the issues of this, of this, uh, of this measure. And it's far reaching. It's damaging to our city, and uh, I urge everyone to vote no. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Mr. Bradley. Thank you. I, uh, too, am opposed to Measure B. I think it's a, um, a ballot measure that is trying to be an effective poison pill. It's trying to force some of our businesses into forcing the union on their employees. I think uh, it was uh, stated and is being stated out there very misleading. I don't think it's a measure that's solving a problem, it's solving a non-problem. I don't know of any instances where there have been any uh, issues of people being assaulted at Terranea or Trump or any other of our major um, uh, employers here within Rancho Palos Verdes. So I think this is a measure in search of a problem. I think it has been uh, pushed out there in a very misleading way. It has uh, made people think that if they vote for it, they're voting for the workers, which is not true. I believe if Measure B is actually implemented, all of the workers at Terranea, Trump, and others will be in a worse position after the enactment of Measure B than they are now. Uh, and I would uh, urge everyone to vote no on Measure B. Okay, all right, thank you. We'll begin now with the next question to Ms. Ferraro. Uh, the question is, we are considered a low crime rate city, yet for the last 12 month period, we have seen 67 burglaries and 110 car crimes. That averages out to six burglaries and nine, crimes, nine car crimes a month. If elected, what actions would you take to reduce this level? Well, one thing I would do would be to try and encourage everyone to get a, an evaluation by the sheriff's deputies of the Lameda Sheriff's Station. They will come out and do a free evaluation for, for about your house, about locks, about the interior, their exterior, and give you any suggestions that they think will help make a difference and help prevent crime. And if you ever watch the channel that RPV has on channel 35, they are constantly running the spot that tells you how to do that. There's an 800 number you can call, make an appointment, and the deputies will come out to your house. Um, one of the things that the council has done and I think is a good thing is the license plate readers 
and that has reduced the number, although it's not down to zero yet, and that's obviously what we'd like to have. But it certainly made, it doesn't necessarily deter the criminals, but it makes catching them a lot easier. And they've reduced the number of incidents of not catching them by almost half. Okay, thank you. Mr. Dida. Our city has implemented a lot of things, and most of it is education. One of the problems we have, especially with automobiles, is that the people that come into our city from outside see it as a very safe city, which we were at one time, and are back there again. You may not realize, but our crime rate now, we're just more sensitive to it, but it's about the same, if not a little lower, than it was when the city was formed. So we've been actually sensitized to it because of the big input after Prop 47 when crime, even in this city, went way up in burglaries. Uh, we have grown to the point where we expect it to be safe and we're a bit lackadaisical about the protection. The Sheriff's Department program to survey your home, keep your car doors locked, even today up and down my street, people leave their garage doors open. It takes just a push of a button to close it. And we've got to educate people that it's not a rural community. We need to take the time to harden the site and they'll move elsewhere. Okay, thank you, Mr. Parasam. Okay, thank you. We are a low, low crime community, and that is through a, a lot of work from the previous councils since the 2011 law change, and they've done a great job in that regard. They've introduced the license plate program, which needs to be continued and really be all-inclusive for all the cities. That'll protect us as a, as a, a, a more de defensible of, of, of a city in itself, and there's, there's only so many in, in ways in and out of the peninsula. Also, the continuation of the incentives which the council just passed for uh, the ring program to encourage more people to take up and install uh, a ring and uh, doorbells and, and, and monitoring. All those things are positive steps. We're gonna have an ongoing battle to get that number down, but that's what, that's what uh, being a low crime city is all about. The ongoing fight to continue the diligence and the cooperation between neighbors and neighborhoods and quick communication of information. And I support that, that, that uh, initiatives that are in place now, and we have to keep up our guard. Thank you. Mr. Bradley. Thank you. I think things that we have implemented to date have been uh, foundational in helping keep our crime rate down. Uh, the uh, license plate reading system of uh, some on the arterial ins and outs of the city or within the peninsula, in fact, uh, has been foundational in helping us do that. I think we need to continue to focus on neighbors helping neighbors, whether that's a formal neighborhood watch program or just neighbors watching out for each other. And then I also think there is a, a uh, portion of personal responsibility. We need to be able to continue to have education. Don't leave things in sight in a uh, unlocked car, which is inviting somebody to do a snatch and grab. Uh, but personal responsibility um, and helping neighbors help each other and continuing to work with the sheriff's department to make sure that we are adequate or, or quickly responding to Alpers or uh, the license plate reading hits and responding to those efficiently. Thank you. Mr. Emmenheiser. Thank you. You know, any crime that occurs to you or happens on your street is a crime wave. And no, matter, no amount of statistics about, oh, it's better than it used to be, is going to make you feel any better. I think our uh, city officials have made great strides uh, with the license plate <coughs> reading program, uh, the, ring, uh, the ring doorbell system. If you don't have a ring doorbell, you're opening yourself up uh, for crime. Uh, and uh, hats off to the city officials for putting in more money uh, into the sheriff's budget over and above what you pay in property taxes. I think we need to be more hard-nosed about crime, actually. I think we can't uh, rely on the sheriff's department to do our job. We need to be the eyes and ears of our neighborhoods. We need to look at more funding. We need to, we need to look at new technology. We as citizens need to tie um, motion sensors to our lights, uh, and uh, we need our HOAs and the Crime Watch program to, to, to uh, 
help us stem uh, the crimes in our community. <coughs> Frankly, we need to pay more attention to protecting our property, our loved ones, and our neighbors. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll begin now with Mr. Dida. And the question asks, what is your position on continued city spending on the PFOWL management program? I have one in my backyard, I want you to know. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, you can get two sides to take a very strong opposing <laughs> views on that. What we're doing is we're trying to maintain a level of PFALs that would hopefully please both sides. And basically, we haven't done anything inhumane or anything like that. Uh, the whole point is to try and keep a level playing field and a, a level number of PFAL so they don't overrun us. There are people who love them, and I think they're beautiful, but when that one uh, peacock got on my roof and tore up some of the shingles, that didn't please me too much. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it, it's a mixed bag. Uh, we need to find a way to cull them, keep the numbers manageable, and not have it overpopulated so that it creates a problem for everybody and still keeps their beauty available to those who enjoy it. Thank you. Mr. Peristan. Thank you. Uh, the city does have a PFAL management program, and over the last few years, the capture rate has went down. I believe I, I saw this presentation a couple weeks ago, and I, I could be off by 10 or 15, but I believe it's last year the capture was about 64. And that's, that's significantly lower than uh, previous years. And it is a balance. It is a bit of a juggle between what's the right number there, what's acceptable to the community, the, the lovers, and the people that aren't loving the PFALs. So right now, I think we're, we're striking a reasonable balance on that. And unless there's something that comes into play that shifts the number of PFALs that are in the community, that we have to reassess this, I'm supportive of the city's current program. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Mr. Bradley. Thank you. I think we need to continue to manage the PFAL uh, populations to a manageable state in various different of uh, the communities. Unfortunately, the PFALs do move around. They are not uh, completely sedentary, um, but we need to be able to continue to uh, manage them uh, and keep their populations in a sustainable way. We need to make sure that our streets are safe, um, I have seen PFAL that have been uh, hit by cars on, for instance, Palos Verde Drive East. I think, you know, if you are driving down Palos Verde Drive East, even at a safe speed, and a 60-pound bird comes out of a tree and swoops across, either one of two things can happen. Either you can hit it and have an accident, or you can have an accident trying to avoid it. Um, so I think our population needs to be managed. I think they're beautiful creatures, but I think uh, because they do not have any natural predators um, here on the hill that they need to be managed and our trapping program is an appropriate uh, level. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Emmenheiser. <clears throat> thank you. You know, I used to live close to, close to Linda and I still remember walking out my front door one morning and uh, I think we had five on the roof and they were having some kind of kind of party going on in, my, uh, uh, in the pine tree uh, above our home. Uh, you know, the last time I attended a city council meeting where, where the uh, abatement program was discussed, it was really a 50-50 proposition with 50% of those speakers totally opposed to the management program and 50% in support. Uh, I think we need to maintain the current plan and we need to do so as humanely as possible. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Ferraro. Thank you. I think this is what I get for putting my phone number on a mail piece. Oh, yeah. I've already gotten calls about peacocks, <laughs> peafowl. And, you know, it is one of those situations where you're darned if you don't and darned if you do, you know. Some people love them. I've, I think they're beautiful in somebody else's yard. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, I, I think the program is probably the, the, the best solution that we could come up with to try and keep some in our city. Uh, as some of you may know, they were imported here by Frank Vanderlip when he was developing his home on the peninsula. And they are beautiful creatures, and they've become a symbol of our area. 
On the other hand, when they start tearing up roofs and dropping stuff everywhere, um, and also being a traffic hazard, they're not so great. So the plan that the city has, I think, is reasonable because they don't just go out and grab a peacock here and one there and uh, move them. It has to be a group of neighbors that get together and several requests have to come in before they'll go out there and trap. So um, I know that the lady that called me was not happy with my answer because she was for keeping all of the peacocks. Um, but I think, you know, in a balance, that's the best that we can do right now. Okay, thank, thank you. you, thank you. Uh, this next question is addressed to all candidates, but all candidates have been answering all the questions. So I think we'll just proceed in the order that we've been. So Mr. Peristam, you would be next. And the question asks, I believe it says, what is something the city should be doing better and what specifically would you do to move things in a better direction? That's the question. Okay. Okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna create an answer and then <laughs> we'll go from there. Okay. You know I'm I'm pretty uh, I'm pretty impressed by the management of this city. I mean we we this city established 47 years ago, and it wasn't luck that got us here. And I'm gonna address this in my closing speech as well that there's a lot of hard decisions went into this, and decisions is really uh, synonymous with, with leadership. So I'm gonna take this a little bit in the direction of, of leadership and how we need to make decisions going forward and how we've made them for the most part in our, in our history. We have challenges. We've passed major legislation in the past that addressed major challenges, including the, uh, the in the case the last couple of years ago with the switchbacks on PV Drive East. I never thought I'd see that really addressed and fixed, but the council took that on. They took that on and they got funding for 50% of that, and I was very impressed. As a as a 35 year resident, I couldn't believe I was going to see that that being addressed. So what I like to see is leadership, and that to me doesn't mean that uh, we will. Uh, selectively choose topics where we're gonna turn that leadership and then ask the community to what do they think of our leadership and then put the vote back on them. I think the electing of people in this election is a representative government and that you empower the elected council to make decisions and provide the leadership, educate the community, and then together we make decisions on how we move forward. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Bradley. Thank you. So I'm gonna paraphrase the question is, what can we as a city do better? And I would say we can always work to do a better job of transparency and uh, mutual respect for opposing opinions. I think we need to continue to uh, work with each other to craft the best way to move forward. You don't always have to agree with everybody, but I think we need to respect everyone's opinion. Um, and I think the city needs to work in as transparent a way as possible and to have public debate on all of these major issues and come to as best a consensus as we possibly can in the public forum. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Emmenheiser. Thank you. Boy, what a great question. I'd like to meet the person that that, uh, that sent that one forward. Uh, you know, the thing that we need to do better is to save some money. Uh, I know when I was chairman of the, of the Finance Advisory Committee, and this is, oh, I don't know, probably 10 years ago, uh, RPB's city budget was 15 million. Now it's up over 30 million. Our reserves at that time, which we were very proud of, was 12 million. Now our reserves are 16 million. Do the math. Our budget went like this, and our reserves went like that. Uh, just because we're getting just because we're getting more money from Terranea and from your property taxes doesn't need, mean we have to go out and spend it. We don't need to hire every consultant with a business card and a website. Uh, but you know, from the discussion you've been hearing tonight, it's pretty clear that the, the, the last city manager in combination with the city officials wanted to go on a spending spree uh, on the landslide, on city hall. Uh, you know, if you look at what has happened with the number, number of consultants, the number of, sta uh, of staff that we have associated with our city government, 
one of these days we're going to have to pay a price. And if a recession hits or if the money from Cherenea, uh, some of the money from Cherenea drives uh, dries up, we're going to wish we had reserves. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Ferraro. Thank you. I think it's wonderful that there's such a large group of people here tonight. And I would really like to see more participation and more education. And I know that in a way that's hard because people are busy with their own lives. They're raising families or they've raised their family and now they're raising their grandchildren or they get to be with their grandchildren. And so people are busy and they get caught up in not paying attention sometimes. And I think maybe right now, Measure B has brought out a lot of people because they've heard the, the, um, the noise about how it's not very good for our area. But I'd like to see more people participate, more people come out. They don't fill the room this much for city council meetings unless there's something that's controversial in the neighborhood. So I would like to see maybe more programs for seniors because we've got an aging community. Um, but we've got resources that can be used and I'd like to see us reach out um, n more on not only the, uh, the TV channels, but somehow with our, um, our newsletter and get more people involved. Thank you. Um, you know, we've been here about an hour. I'm going to um, take the liberty of proposing just about a five minute break so everybody can stand up and then sit down again. So we will begin in five minutes. Thank you. I would like to mention, um, due to my omission, we did not allow Mr. Dida to respond to the last question. Please, everyone, please, if I could have quiet so we could begin again. There are people in the back who are continuing to talk. It's the league people, too. Wow. That's scary. I need a gavel. I don't have a gavel. Thank you very, very much. I wondered whether I should do that, but it seemed like it would be a good idea, except gathering you back together is, is problematic. But anyway, I wish to apologize to Mr. Dida, who didn't have an opportunity to respond to the last question, so let me give you that opportunity now. Thank you. I've got four points to make. First, it's not how much you spend, but how wisely you spend it. We've put $45 million of city money, and we've put $5 million of your tax money for Sanitation District 5, and all we've done is make the slide worse. So when we're talking about spending an equal amount of money to solve the problem, I don't see a problem. Uh, now, the other thing is that we should take advantage. We've got people in our community that have the expertise. This is a very well-educated community. We don't take fully advantage of that. There have been times when they've come forward and proposed things, and in the prior regime, before we got the current regime of staff, uh, they wouldn't even listen to them. And as a result, in some cases, we spent twice as much as we should have. The last thing is we need to control the windfall. There are, and I've done things with our attorney and contracts to stop that. There was a time where they could do an engineering improvement. <laughs> they would save the city $600,000, but they would get to keep 300. And they found that engineering improvement the very next day after they got the contract. That's a game they play. And the other thing we need to watch out for is analysis, a paralysis by analysis. We have studied the slide for 45 years. There's no point, and we know what it is. It is not the Gabions, it's not the Caissons, it's not the Army Corps of Engineers uh, of breakwater. It's water coming from up the hill. We need to take care of it, 
And that's what the plan is. Thank you. Thank you so much. My apologies, Steve. <laughs> okay, we will begin now with Mr. Bradley. Uh, the question is, would you be willing to lift the ban on owner-occupied Airbnb rentals? Yes or no is what it says. That's the question. I guess you can answer with a statement, too. <laughs> I was going to say, if I have to do yes or no, that's going to be hard. No. Yeah. <laughs> So that's actually something that's come before the Planning Commission while I've been chairman, and it, it's an interesting issue. Um, I am a firm believer in property rights, and people should be able to use their property uh, to the best of their ability. And if that's operating an Airbnb uh, that's owner-occupied, um, I think there should be some latitude for that. On the other hand, there have been some instances within the city before we enacted a ordinance where there was an inordinate amount of traffic in certain areas that just what wasn't set up to ever support that amount of traffic. So I think it has to be done on a case-by-case -case basis. It has to be looked at whether that individual community, that street, that area could support it. Um, so the answer to the yes or no question is maybe. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Emenheiser. Thank you. Uh, the answer is no. Uh, I'd like, personally, I'd like to see a little bit more discernment. I think we need to, con we need, we needed to concentrate on the party houses. Uh, you know, somebody on site that was running their house out to, you know, a visitor from, from France wasn't necessarily exciting me so much as it was the party houses. And I know, uh, even now, we still have a, have, have a problem with, uh, uh, with party houses and RPV, and I'm so glad to see the city council uh, moved in the direction we recommended three years ago, which was to, to work uh, more closely with the sheriff's department as opposed to uh, having, having a prohibition without teeth, having a prohibition that required hiring consultants as opposed to working with the sheriff's department and actually putting a stop to it. Thank you. Mrs. Ferraro. I think I come down mostly on the side of people having property rights. On the other hand, they don't have a right to infringe on their neighbors, either with noise or parking issues. And it seems to me like what has caused the most problem with these are the party houses, where and oftentimes the owners don't even live there. They simply rent out the house on a single-use basis or maybe a weekend. Um, and they're, they're affecting other people's property, and that's not right. So I guess in a way I'm, I'm like D what Dave said. Well, that Dave said. Forgot Dave, not this day. One of us. One of us. We always yes. need more Dave. <laughs> um, that maybe, you know, a, I think somebody that wants to have a couple come from London or Paris or Rome, um, or even Rome, Iowa, um, to rent a, rent a room for a little bit so they can see the. Um, the benefits of our our um, area, I don't have a problem with that. In fact, we've been host parents to many exchange students. So um, I think it's maybe. Okay, Mr. Dida. The problem with Airbnb is the short-term commercial rental and you call them party houses. There are corporate entities that own more than one house in our city that were doing that. It's strictly a, f a function of money. It, it's not a hotel. There's nothing wrong with renting a room to somebody over a weekend. If you're there, okay, it's like a B&B. &B. Uh, that's bed and breakfast, not uh, a real bed and breakfast. So uh, there's nothing wrong with that, actually. The rental for a long term is also not a problem. It's the strictly uh, money-making scheme to convert a residential area into a commercial area, and that's wrong. We've got enough of that going on, and it's just plain wrong. All the other functions that were talked about as exchange students, someone coming for, to visit for a couple of days from out of town, nothing wrong with that. It's never been a problem. It doesn't impact the community. It's the impacts we have to stop. Okay, Mr. Peristam. Thank you. I think after a long battle on that, the city council generally got it correct. 
30 days is a reasonable time frame as a minimum for, for occupancy for B and B's or that type of uh, that type of uh, rentals. You know, we here are a very stable community, and the way to assure remaining a stable community is to have owner occupied dwelling units, and that's where we are. We're a low density community, and if we have that type of, of uh, ownership that are mostly owner occupied, we'll continue to have a stable community. It's that simple. So we're not built right now for, for commercial development. We have, a, we have a hotel. We have maybe a little, a couple other units that are for rent in, on Western Avenue. But for the most part, we're a low density residential community. So I'm supportive of what the city did in, when they enacted the B&Bs. There was actually some speculation and some home purchases and sales with the anticipation that the B&Bs would be a really a lucrative market in the city. And they, uh, it didn't work out for them as an investment. So I'm, I'm pretty glad, I'm happy the way uh, things have worked out. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll begin now with Mr. Emenheiser. Um, what is your plan for the coyote problem in RPV? What do you think about what Torrance is doing? Another great question. <laughs> you know, the coyote issue, I think, is, is, is one that people in RPB take very seriously. Um, we take our two dogs uh, over to, to the Point Vicente An Animal Hospital, and I see these pictures up by the secretary table of, you know, have you seen my Fluffy and, and things like that. And, and you have an idea of where where Fluffy went. Uh, we've, you know, in some nights you can hear that here near my house, you can hear the, the coyotes uh, making their rounds. It is a, a serious problem. People are worried about their dogs, they're worried about their cats, they're worried about their small children, they're worried about walking out by themselves at, 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 at twilight, as they should. I think, uh, I think Torrance may be on to something. Uh, you know, for, for a long time, I, I've, I've wondered, you know, why can certain cities up against the mountains do something about bears that are a native species, and we can't do something about coyotes that are a native species? And so I think uh, the trapping program, the, the, what I've read uh, that, that Torrance is embarking on, is something we ought to pay, pay a lot of attention to, and we ought to use it, to, use it too if it's working in Torrance. We've got to do something about the coyotes. People are scared. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Ferraro. Well, we've lost two cats. And in one case, my grandson, whose room is on the front of the house and has a balcony, he saw the coyote going down the street with Duchess in her in the mouth. And that was really traumatic for him. So I, I think we have to keep after them. I've been told by the city manager when I talked to him about it that if you reduce the population of the coyotes, they will just have more pups. I don't know if that's true or not, but I still think we need to trap them whenever we can uh, and remove them from the area because we don't want to have to have a real tragedy with the child to cause us to re rethink the issue. So I'm in favor of removing the coyotes as many as we can. Mr. Dida. Coyotes are a problem in terms of what we can do. Uh, you can trap them, but you cannot relocate them. If you trap them, you have to euthanize them. Uh, and reducing the number of coyotes, they have a mechanism that all they do, and as Barbara said, is correct. Uh, they just have larger litters. The key is food. You, they actually uh, procreate to a level that they can sustain based on the food they have. You reduce the food, you will reduce the coyotes. And you, you gotta euthanize them if you catch them, and I think that's an appropriate thing to do because they are not endemic to this area. Okay, thank you. Mr. Peristan. Okay, thank you. I attended the first meeting the city held with the Fish and Game Commission about a year and a half or two years ago <laughs> in this room, where we got an education on what we can and cannot do with coyotes. And we have some serious limitations on what we can do. 
we can't relocate, as, uh, as uh, Mr. Deiter said, we need to utilize them if we do catch them. And they do have a natural ability to balance, and it's just not balanced to, uh, with population, but it's reflective of where the food sources are. One of the things they pointed out, the first thing that the Fish and Game folks uh, pointed out was, was, was really simple, don't feed them. And that is a big deal because what we've done is we've retrained their natural instincts of being afraid of humans. So by feeding them, now they're bolder and they're more likely to come into our backyards and be comfortable with uh, pursuing our animals, our small dogs. There, I, I walk in Friendship Park with my dogs and I know the coyotes there on a first name basis. They're always there. They live there. I can see them in the morning. I can see them in the afternoon. We know them. There's this coexistence that exists as long as that balance can be maintained. The next step that the fishing game folks said is make sure your, your trash lids are closed as well. And that's the other four. That's again, feeding them. It's a secondary way of feeding them. So we need to follow the steps that's laid out for us and that will help solve part of the problem. There is the extreme where there is aggressive coyotes that do uh, are, are attacking animals, and I, I believe and support the, the euthanizing those coyotes if they can be identified. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bradley. Thank you. I think we need to continue to practice and implement a sustainable management plan. I think we need to have an educational uh, component to that and practice personal responsibility. Like uh, Stephen said, uh, part of that is um, making sure trash containers are are secured, making sure you don't leave pet food out, and not training the coyotes to come into the more urban portions of the city, but stay in the more rural areas. So I think it, it's a combination of practicing the, uh, a sustainable management plan, trapping, euthanizing, as well as an education campaign to help our citizens with a, um, a uh, personal responsibility to help uh, keep them out of the urban area. Thank you. We'll begin now with Mrs. Ferraro. The question is, what is your position on the upcoming vote on the Zone 2 EIR, Environmental Impact Report? Boy, that's a good question. We were dealing with that way back when. It's always tough to, to make decisions for someone else's property. And I know that some people have been able to build and it, it all depends on the stability of that particular property. So I think it should be considered carefully. It is going to happen, the vote is going to happen before any of us are on the council except for Ken. So I'm sure that the council has thought through all of this and that they will, um, do the right thing. Okay, perhaps somebody, um, uh, one of our candidates would explain what Zone 2 EIR does. Could I ask somebody to volunteer? <laughs> I'm sure David. <coughs> oh. Go ahead, get your own no, council. Plan to get Go ahead. Uh, zone 2 is an area that's uh, in the Portuguese Bend area. Mm -hmm. uh, it's become a problem because this again is my opinion, not a, uh, the council's point of view, but it's just mine alone. When that came up in terms of whether it, the 1.5 stability ratio should have been used, the question before that the court raised is, can you identify specifically where the value is one? The answer was no, you can't. And therefore, the decision was made that therefore you can't say it what is 1.5. And since you can't say it what is 1.5, how can you implement it? And that's what destroyed that whole process. It was fought on a legal basis, not a technical basis. It would have been better if somebody told the judge the reason it's 1.5 is because <coughs> we don't know exactly one, and that's a safety factor, just like the chair you're sitting in, the car you're driving, the airplane you're flying. You can't ever spin, spin something down to that final level, therefore you put a safety factor in it, and that's what the purpose was. That safety factor in that area has been destroyed, and that's what's giving us a problem with zone two. Okay, so I, you, you're next to, to speak anyway, so, so you're... I'm through. I give him more time. <laughs> okay. 
Um, so, Mr. Peristam. Okay. I, I think what I've read about this the, and, the, and the feedback has been a focus in a little different area there. It's about the impact of, uh, of traffic in through that area. And particularly, there's been a, a lot of response to the intersection between Via, I believe it's Via Riviera and Hawthorne Boulevard, and the recommendation for a stoplight to be implemented there. This is part of this EIR, and this is the part that, that I've had the, seen the most visibility on. And so stop yeah. me, Ken, if I'm missing something no, here. You're, you're not missing anything except that this is so far away from zone two that they've taken the traffic study way out of bounds to, in my opinion, and so. Yeah. Okay. okay, you, could, you still I'll, I'll, I'll continue. So, but <laughs> yeah, that is, please. that has been the, 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 the most significant feedback that's come in the last couple of weeks on the, as of the release yep. of the, IR, the EIR report and the, and the feedback period for comments. So that takes us into a different place. It is up, it is before us. It is a, 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 a concern with traffic safety. And I think that the city has to, has to recognize that we probably have a half dozen locations that we have to seriously consider having stoplights at. We all, nobody likes that. But the public safety now is such that we're going to have to probably take a deep breath and accept the fact that we're gonna have some more streetlights in our city. And this location is certainly one of the major candidates uh, for, for that public safety move and install a stoplight. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Bradley. So I will say that uh, I don't want to opine on something that is going to be before the council or something that could be before the council in the future, um, but I will say that any environmental impact report for zone two or anything else, um, if elected, I will take into full consideration and look at both sides and try to come up with the best solution and the best evaluation of it as possible. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Emmenheiser. A lot, of, a lot of people are very passionate about uh, this Zone 2 EIR. And somehow or another, we've also gotten traffic lights, lights mixed into it also. Uh, I actually don't think I can add anything that hasn't been said by the other candidates. Okay, thank you. Uh, we begin now with Mr. Dida. Um, hundreds of thousands of Californians are without power tonight because of blackouts imposed by the utility companies. <laughs> what can the city do to help us avoid this situation? Well, the first thing we can do is make sure that we take care of all the areas that would be fire prone. We are uh, categorized as a very severe fire district and mostly because of the canyons. And when the city was first formed in 73, we had a fire and those canyons acted like a chimney and took out a few homes. I think we have to have a very clear understanding of brush control notwithstanding the fact that you're gonna cut stuff down that some people might say, gee, I don't want that move because you're destroying some habitat. Uh, you gotta make a choice between humans and habitat. Uh, I'd like to preserve all the habitat we possibly can, but I don't wanna put homes in, at risk. And if we do a good management of that kind of uh, fire potential, especially in the canyons, I think we can do a good job. Thank you. Mr. Peristan. Thank you. I think in, in, in a sort of unusual way, the events of the, the blackouts and the utility companies being held accountable for the starting or the, uh, the intensifying of some of these fires will actually uh, change the way we approach utilities in the future. And that is, uh, I know there's a, a program in a way in the city today about under, underground utilities. And historically, that's been more of a, a view issue, but that's been reframed in the last year, and last year or two with the fire, with the fires that have been uh, attributed to, uh, in some parts, in some places, the, the actual utility poles exploding. So we have to have an opportunity here. So if we can, if we can reevaluate where we have an opportunity to sink or to uh, underground utility lines, including the preserve, including the preserve, that needs to be part of, a, of, a, of a, a master plan that needs to evolve and have a discussion about and, and placing those utilities or rerouting those going forward, then I think that we can actually benefit 
from the visibility this is causing and hopefully not be victims of that, that we can take some actions in the future and that it will be working to our benefit as that's reframed and probably at some point being uh, funding, being attached to incentives that will help us in our, uh, in our undergrounding efforts. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Bradley. Well, unfortunately, I think we missed a wonderful opportunity recently uh, to work with SoCal Edison to underground utilities as they were recapitalizing most of their infrastructure throughout the city. I think everybody's seen them replacing uh, many of the uh, legacy wooden poles. I think that would have been a perfect time to try to work with Edison to come up with a solution. I think the solution for the high fire area, like uh, Stephen has talked about, is to look at undergrounding and to uh, make our system as safe as possible. Uh, also to study the availability of putting in microgrids in to be able to have a redundant power system that's resilient in the case of emergency. Um, all things that are kind of on the cutting edge of power distribution, uh, but something that certainly has to be considered as we move forward. I believe uh, PG&E, cut power to roughly 600,000 residents up in the Bay Area uh, today because of the high fire danger. Um, and it's also uh, due to the fact that the uh, state of California won't indemnify the power companies for uh, liability in the case of fires. So they're taking some very drastic uh, responses to that. And I think we need to work with those power companies to come up with a safe and stable power grid that won't be prone to fire. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Emmenheiser. Thank you. You know, just sharing sharing some thoughts. Uh, you know, I think the city is is doing a, a pretty good job of working with the land conservancy, uh, the utilities, and and uh, paying attention to to brush clearance. Uh, certainly, the goats are helping out. Uh, but I think you know that we need to change our perspective. Uh, I I used to never worry too much about the tree that was growing next to my house, and I do now. And, and boy, I'd hate to lose that tree, but I'd rather lose the tree than lose my house. And I think uh, we all need to come to the realization that we are in a more, a more fire prone area than we realize, even though most of our streets look like neighborhoods rather than forests. Uh, I think the undergrounding is, is a great idea. It's something I'm hearing a, a lot on the campaign trail. There are a lot of people saying, gosh, I wish I could get rid of, get rid of those utility poles in my backyard. Frankly, I don't think the city sending a letter out to people saying it'll be $50,000 a lot is, is, is a very helpful solution. I think we need to come up with a better plan. Uh, and lastly, uh, one of the things that is in the new Civic Center plan is a discussion about moving Station 53. If you think it's Station 53, it's the one that's closest to the preserve. And so uh, moving that back up the hill, I don't think is a great idea. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mrs. Ferraro. Thank you. There is one theory that these blackouts are sort of punishment by the companies for um, changing the laws. Um, and partly that may be true, but I think we here have to really focus on fire safety. And once again, I wanna point out Channel 35. You can learn a lot by watching the RPV TV. And they have the, a fire captain on there talking about a lot of ways that you can help. One of the things that Dave just mentioned was about uh, cutting trees that are absolutely next to your house and having space around it, uh, making sure your batteries are in good working order, making sure your sprinklers are in good working order. Do you have a fire extinguisher in your home? And does everyone in the home know how to use it? I realized I didn't know how to use it. And I have one in my classroom at school. I'm going to remedy that very soon. Um, but I think we need to focus on safety here because we have become relatively complacent in the last few years because we haven't had any major fire. I do remember the one that the bird started when it hit a power line. And I'm hoping that we can underground some of the utilities that now have poles and wires going everywhere. 
but it is very expensive, and it's expensive when the the homeowners have to um, have that burden placed on them. So. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're getting close to about 20 of, and I want to give every, every candidate an opportunity for their closing statement, which is two minutes. And um, following that, uh, we'll, we'll close the meeting with some additional information. So we can begin again where we started. Mr. Emmenheiser, if you wouldn't mind. Thank you. Closing statements or Correct. another question? No, closing statements. Oh, good. Yeah. Thank you very much. Again, I want to uh, thank the, the League of Vo uh, Women's, uh, uh, the League of Women Voters. Actually, and the you know, I just remembered I said we were going to go reverse order when I made my opening statement. So, would you mind if I no, stick not to at what all. I said? So, so, so you want to go with a Dave, but just yeah, the other right. one. A, a different <laughs> Dave. variety be, of Dave. Okay. Just to be correct. So it's, there's always. <laughs> thank you. Little, Sorry. You're, you're yeah. Dave will go first. <laughs> right. um, so in closing, I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. I think it shows uh, a great uh, civic involvement for our citizens to come out and to be able to ask questions of all five candidates. I think you have five great candidates that have all shown uh, their dedication to the city over the years. Um, I think you have some great choices before you uh, on November 5th. Um, I think I have some differences from the other candidates. I think I'm the only, well, I know I'm the only candidate that has two children still in Palos Verdes Unified School Districts. I'm also a graduate of Palos Verdes Unified School Districts. I was a Rolling Hills School, a Rolling Hills High School graduate. Um, uh, I think I'm, um, a good candidate. I think I'm here to, uh, for the long term. Uh, I've been a resident of uh, RPV since prior to its incorporation. Uh, I can remember growing up here in the Hill, and I want to help it bring it into the future. I want to focus on uh, moving us into the 21st century and attacking some of the problems that are going to be coming up before the city, um, 5G cell phone um, deployment. Uh, that we didn't talk about tonight, um, the uh, affordable housing goals that are coming before us, some of these big issues that are going to be coming down the pike. I want to be on the city council to help solve it for the best interests of RPV uh, in general. Um, I want to uh, dedicate that I would will continue to strive to preserve our rural oasis uh, here in Rancho Palos Verdes. And on November 5th, I hope I can get your vote. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Peristat. Thank you. And thanks for holding this event and for everyone for coming out tonight. On November 5th, you and the voters will elect three members of the city council to serve as your representatives to make the difficult decisions required to keep our city strong. That is what you demand from us in return for your vote. And that is what I intend to do if elected. We live in a pretty great place. Most of what we've done is not because of luck, but as I was speaking about earlier, it's because of efforts and decisions of city leaders that have come before us and the informed residents that elected them. They set a very high bar. My campaign is about protecting what has been achieved over the last 47 years, as well as preparing us for the future. There's been many acts of bold leadership by previous councils, and I think we discussed some of those earlier, Proposition P, uh, M, view protection, neighborhood compatibility ordinance are just a few examples of that. All bold acts and just a few examples of the tradition of leadership in the footsteps I hope to follow. Leadership requires making difficult decisions. Leadership is not just saying no to every issue that will cost money in the short term and then declaring yourself to be a fiscal conservative. Fiscal conservative means determining what is best for the city in the long run through investigation and analysis, and then sometimes saying yes and sometimes saying no. It means distinguishing wants from needs. I'm a fiscal conservative. My kids will say I'm just cheap. I can live with that. I want to help the city get everything it needs, but I do not need to give the city things that it may already just want. I will not fund and this has been said before, a Taj Mahal for City Hall or a Palos Verdes Drive South expansion bridge over the slide area. When the time comes for these projects to reach the point of clearly being defined, phased, and cost, which are they are not today, either of those projects, we will have the information to have an informed discussion followed by a decision. That's leadership. There are usually no easy answers for doing the job right. They're only hard work and a display of leadership. That is what I promise you if I'm elected, 
and I am the top name on the ballot, and I ask you for your vote on November 5th. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Dida. Yeah, I want to thank the League of Women Voters for holding this forum and the many forums that has held ever since the city was formed. Uh, the League of Women Voters was instrumental in forming this city because it was their land use study that identified the problem. And with their help on the Save Our Coastline, we actually are now following basically the principles and the outline in our general plan, what was proposed by them. So thank you very much for that. You're an integral part of that uh, effort. As far as I'm concerned, I want to retain local control and stem the overriding pressure from the state in taking over our local control. I want to improve public safety, and that can be done by making our safety system more efficient and responsive to specific events rather than doing it just as a broad category. We talk about spending money. Uh, I don't want to spend money on stuff that doesn't gonna, isn't going to help and just going to make things worse. That's what we've been doing for the past 40 years and the $50 million it has cost us for Portuguese Bend. It can be controlled, and the money in the long run will be well paid for because we won't be paying that to maintain the road. It'll become similar to the other arterials in our city in terms of maintenance. I want to defeat the union uh, initiative because that's just going to put the city in controlling a business, which is not our function, and again, cost you thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars to administer that and take a, every legal a step for <coughs> grievances and that sort of thing. So with that, I'm the only candidate with the institutional memory of the city founding principles, and I'd like to leave you with one thought. A city that does not remember its origin, history, and founding principles is like a tree without roots and will not flourish. Please vote for me on November 5th. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Ferraro. Yes, thank you so much for putting this on tonight, and thank you to all of you who have come out. It's really wonderful to feel like it was, it was good to come because so many people are here and listening to what we think is important. And I want to see, you know what? I had this all written out, and I think I'm just going to throw it away. And I want to thank Ken for being a founder of this city because I have felt blessed ever since I moved here that I could live in a beautiful place like this. And it wasn't even in the beginning that I appreciated the city and the fact that we are a city and that we have low density instead of condos on the coast. And I also want to thank Dave for mentioning the other five of us, or the five of us, because frankly, I don't think you can go wrong with any three of us. I mean, I really do want to serve again, but it's not... The, it's not necessary if you choose somebody else. I, I would like for you to pick me. A lot, of, a lot of you have known me through Las Madrasitas or Assistance League or when we went to St. Peter's, we now go to Mary Star. You know, Charlie has been involved with the Cabrillo Museum and the Rotary. We've been involved in the community for decades. And we care about this community. That's the reason I wanted to serve again, because I'm really concerned about local control. And we are go we've got a, the fight ahead of us, really, from Sacramento. And I would like a chance to serve again. I don't have as much historical knowledge as he has, but I'm pretty close. I'm within three years. So... I don't even know what number I am on the ballot, but if you check Barbara Ferraro for RPV City Council on November 5th, it would be an honor for me to serve again. Thank, thank you, you so thank you so much. Mr. Emenheiser. Thank you. You know, I'm gonna kind of throw away my script, Barbara, and, and, and join the Love Fest. I, I think the city, <laughs> the city will be in good hands with any of the three candidates up here. Um, 
I had an interesting conversation at halftime. Uh, I'm not going to rat you out, Alicia, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but she says, it doesn't sound to me like you want to spend any money. And I said, yeah, that's probably right. Uh, I really do think that we have been given a number of blessings. And just because we have money from Chiranea and from the increasing property taxes, uh, we shouldn't let it burn a hole in our pocket and feel like we have to go out and hire every consultant. Uh, there was another debate not <coughs> hasn't, hasn't been, uh, been on uh, Channel 33 yet, uh, three weeks ago, and I'm really pleased to see the number of candidates that are moving over to the Ammonheiser side of being a skeptic about uh, City Hall and the landslide. So uh, I do want to, you know, I want to thank the League. I want to thank the Chamber. I want to thank all of you for being here. Uh, Barbara and I were having a conversation recently. We sa said, well, how many people in RPB do you really think are paying attention? And we said, oh, maybe it's probably about 200. I think 80 of them are in the room here tonight. <laughs> uh, if you believe in uh, experience is important, I'd greatly appreciate your vote and your support. Thank you so much for coming, and thank you, Linda, for being our moderator. Thank you. Um, before closing, I wanted to mention that the forum on Proposition B, which we've heard a lot about tonight, better known as the Hospitality Working Conditions Ordinance, will be held right here a week from today from 7 to 8.30 with both sides represented, if you're interested in hearing more information about that. Uh, I also encourage you to log on to the League's website titled Voters Edge to obtain more information about our current uh, RPV candidates. I'm hoping all will sign on, not all have. Um, and I, uh, the, a little bit more about the website, it provides information on, on our candidates, uh, their education, their experience, their biographies. And uh, we also, this also covers other elections that we have. So I'll have our bookmarks out on the table. Um, just also mentioning this, th this election is about you. Uh, participate in our government. Let your voice be heard. And um, I, I just, I'm encouraging possibly uh, information about the League as well, which will be on the back table if you're interested in knowing more about us or, or, or joining. Uh, on behalf of the League of Women Voters, the Palos Verdes Chamber of Commerce, and the Palos Verdes branch of the American Association of University Women, Women, I would like to thank the candidates for running, and f as has been mentioned before, for all of you for being here uh, and for being such an attentive audience, although you didn't sit down right away after the break, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I mentioned I left my phone on. So I also extend my gratitude to our voter service director, Nancy Marr, who did over here, who did all of the coordinating for coordinating this event and our many volunteers. It really takes a village. Uh, Cindy Condon, Lisa Jackson, Vi Ungerish, Ann Shaw, Ellen Hupp, and Julie Kramer. So it takes a lot of people to put this all together. And lastly, for those of you who have further questions of our candidates, I'm sure they would be willing to stay and chat with you if you wish to speak to them personally. Uh, we're ending a little bit early, so the candidates will have time to send, put out their information on the back table so that you'll have an opportunity to pick it up, and we still will conclude at 9 p.m. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you.